I'd like to say hello to everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome to today's webinar. Um, this is Emine, Head of Sales in VRLoop Academy. And today we are here with Dr. Jane Harrington and my colleague, Ipek Paksoy, our product manager. And um, in this webinar, Jane is going to talk about a topic that is very trending uh, and that we will see an increase in interest in the coming years. The place of um, digital visualization and virtual reality in education. So um, without wasting time, I'd like to start by introducing Jane and then we will continue with her presentation. Uh, so Dr. Jane Harrington is an associate professor at St. George's University School of Medicine in Granada, West Indies. Uh, and Dr. Harrington is an American trained microbiologist with 20 plus years experience in higher education. And she considers herself a, a, a student centered educator and dedicated to exploring best use of current technology to improve learning outcomes. Outside of her um, teaching responsibilities for a second year medical school and research on environmental origins of antibiotic resistance. She also engages in K-12 outreach to improve diversity and equity in sciences. Uh, so please uh, feel free to write if you have any questions. I'll be directing your questions to Jane at the end of the presentation. And now we can start with the presentation. Thank you all. Uh, Jane, I think we're good to go. All right. Thank you so much for that introduction, M&A. Um, so I, uh, I guess I'm a, I'm a professor and just a note that I, I'm not hired by this company. This is a passionate topic that I'm, I, given that you're attending this uh, in our pre-holiday chaos, I assume that you are all on board with using technology for education. So I'm gonna tell a story about generations. I'm gonna tell a story about what things were like whenever we were growing up versus what things are like now and the future. And so um, I, I'll first kind of go through a historical timeline of, of technology and education uh, to bring us to the current day. But I also want to do uh, um, a review of some of the literature. What are the findings? And um, what is it about uh, digital vis visualization and the potential about virtual reality? And um, why is this beneficial? Um, and this also will highlight some uh, ways that we can uh, better incorporate different modalities for learning. So I'm going to set the stage of talking about generations. Um, I myself, I was born uh, in this little cluster right here, right here. So I'm what considered was Generation X. So uh, looking at our, um, around our World War II, this is our, um, they're sometimes called the silent generation, where many, many of our educators are what we call the baby boomers. And so this is whenever we had explosion of population after World War II. Um, and so this is uh, roughly set from 1946 uh, birth date to 1964. And we have our um, Generation X, which is what I identify with, um, and that the, the, our educators right now are primarily our Generation X and our boomers. However, whenever we get into the later years of Birthdays, so the the millennials they get a lot in the the press and a lot of jokes of uh, avocado toast. Um, but these individuals, uh, they, they are they they came up of the age whenever we had computers. And so when we talk about education, it's really uh, think of this information age of, of before our computers and after computers. Because whenever it comes to education, I mean it, it is a really different perspective. And then we have our Gen Z. So I'm a mother. I have a 13 year old child. And her perspective of the world and her perspective of, of learning and information is so dramatically different than what I grew up with that I, I have to adapt as an educator to, to, to really um, uh, reach our younger generations. So I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, add another term. It's the digital immigrants and versus the digital natives. So around the, um, in, uh, the 1990s, that's whenever our, our computers got into the classroom, got into our 
homes. And so uh, it, this is a, a term in, uh, in education, the digital natives. These are students, these are learners who uh, they, they, they grew up using computers and technology. And so that's normal for them versus many of our educators now uh, we're considered as digital immigrants. That means that we didn't start using computers until adulthood. I'm gonna go ahead and take a poll right now. Um, and I want to ask which of these generations do you identify with? So I'm gonna launch the poll. I'll just give about 30 um, seconds. So I'll, I'll time it for 30 seconds. Uh, which one do you uh, identify best with? So I'm getting response. I'll give uh, 10 more seconds just to get your uh, your perspective. And, and thank you very much for tuning in. Um, I'm, I'm very uh, curious at the end, whenever you have questions, identify where you're from, because uh, this is a, a really a, a global topic. So uh, fantastic. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. And let's see if I can um, share the results. So we have a uh, generation X and we have millennials and we have some individuals who are from uh, uh, Gen Z. And so this, uh, I just so really want to uh, have the, the key, key points that whenever we're talking about education, we have a range of perspectives, we have diverse learners, we have diverse educators. And so it is important to have that in mind of whenever you're designing uh, your, your material or you're out from the learner perspective that have an idea that somebody's coming from a different generation and our ability to interact with technology is different. So that being said, I'm going to uh, walk us through some key points points. I'm going to go ahead and stop the poll. Um, so uh, look at some technology and education. Let's get way back in time. So talking about the, the uh, education technology, the baby boomers. So uh, this is prior to a uh, birth date of 1964. So when um, our baby boomers grew up, <laughs> abacus, I remember using this. It was very kinesthetic as counting. This has been around for millennia, the abacus. But I remember doing math, uh, mathematic problems uh, with this. And even the Montessori, they still use the abacus. So um, also we have, uh, I just still remember um, uh, going to the library. I mean, that was like a big, it was uh, during the week and you went to the class and you used the library. So this is their Dewey Decimal Library catalog. Um, and also a major technology, this was the screen projector. And so um, for any of you who identify as Gen X, uh, you absolutely remember there were these little plastic sheets that the professors would write on. Yeah, remember that? And that was the way of learning and something that I want to point out for here that it was very touch, it was very kinesthetic, it was very much that was paper based um, uh, um, and that's how information was available was provided. For my generation, um, so I'm in Gen X and so I was born uh, in that category don't need to be specific, but when I grew up, that's whenever we started getting more of uh, technology, like cutting edge cool stuff. Um, uh, we didn't have this in the classroom, but the Nintendo, or we were able to play with stuff and we could manipulate. And that's something that was a big change of previous generations is the ability to interact with technology using your hands. Um, absolutely, the VCR cart, that was like the highlight whenever it was a Friday and and you got to ha watch a, a VCR um, and that I, I remember the first time I saw a VCR, I was uh, saw Old Yeller um, and, and th this was really cutting edge at this particular point in time. But now whenever we have education, it was using technology and things were moving. And that's what we have pictures, we have very visual. And so when individuals who grew up as, as starting around the Gen X, we say I'm a very visual learner because I started seeing things um, that had a lot of color and depth to it. Um, just also, um, uh, I do recall, this was one of our first uh, desktop computers um, and, and just change perspective. Our school had one whenever I was in elementary school and it was such a big deal to be able to use this. Um, the floppy disk did not stick around, but uh, Oregon Trail, uh, you can still uh, play that game. So this generation, I think of the Gen X as their transition of going from a 
strictly paper-based education model uh, to start getting into use of technology. And it was just so um, exciting whenever I was a young child uh, to have these kinds of uh, visual differences aside from just straight on the paper. So this is really looking at decades of modern uh, um, education, really up until approximately 1990. So when we shift into the education technology of the millennials, um, and so this is uh, you know, uh, people who were born in the 80s and early 90s, but really the 90s, I almost want to put a little asterisk right here. That's when things changed dramatically whenever we started getting the computer. And so the desktop computers, uh, I, I, I imagine a classroom without desktop computers seems like a really uh, an ancient foreign concept uh, shown, of course, some of our early Macs. Um, I, I certainly remember these in the classrooms uh, by the time that I was in uh, high school. Um, and so desktop computers, that's whenever uh, we were able to have more information at the touch of the fingers and it as allowing the student, allowing the learner to, to have access to more information. So I also bring up uh, the CD-ROM. So this is actually from eBay. This is from um, uh, a, 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 a really artifact, what have you. Uh, and so previously encyclopedias, they were in the library. It was a book that came out once a year, but now we were able to condense so much information on the CD-ROM and it was accessible. And so that is something that's really beneficial about these really leaps and bounds with um, the technology is that the computers now became accessible in the classroom. They became accessible uh, in um, uh, in our in our homes, and there's so much information that now was available that you could really um, just set the world off for different education um, uh, material. So now I'm gonna get into specific years about some major leaps. Um, very, very important is going to be 1997. That's whenever Blackboard Learning Management System came out. And that uh, for, uh, for any of you who are uh, educators right now, I'm actually gonna ask uh, which of the learning management system do you use? Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and launch. Uh, so uh, this is asking which learning management system does your institution subscribe to? So which do you use? So uh, Canvas, Moodle, Blackboard, Edmo, Google Classroom. So there's the other ones. This now gave the power, <laughs> I want to say power, um, to our educators, to our administrators, that we were able to, uh, to, to create lessons, to have assessments, to have our report cards, um, as well as things can be more standardized so that our um, we could have linking across from different courses. So uh, go ahead and um, just do 10 more seconds for the LMS. I'm seeing um, more respondents for Google Classroom. So whenever we have an adaptation to new technology, Absolutely. Whenever this first came out, there was a lot of resistance. I came across an opinion paper uh, in 1998 that was criticizing learning and management system. So it takes a little bit to adapt to new technology. So I'll go ahead and end the poll. And I'm going to share the results. So um, the learning management systems have really, uh, we've got lots of different platforms. Uh, so the highest result, uh, highest respondents, I guess, say Google Classroom. Um, and I just want to kind of pause and ask this question. Can you imagine the global pandemic without the learning management systems? It's really, it would be very difficult to have the sort of uh, management of uh, our, our e-learning. So um, I just want to just kind of highlight that when these new technologies come out, they become such a way of life that we, we can't imagine um, our, our teaching without them. So that was a very big uh, learning management system. That was a tool for, for the educators uh, uh, to really harness all that massive information that we just saw with the CD-ROMs and we can have it organized and we can guide our students. So some other technologies to highlight in the, um, uh, in the millennials who are coming up in our, uh, the, their learnings um, is uh, just to remind you all, um, we have December 31st, 1999 at uh, 11.59 p.m. 
Uh, and this was our Y2K threat, so January 2020. Um, but ever since this time, we have a whole generation of coders, of programmers who are solving problems that we don't even know exist because our programmers, our coders, our designers, our, our people who are creating virtual reality, they're solving these problems that uh, most of us educators and learners aren't even aware of. So something else that has been really fantastic is looking about um, uh, tools within the classroom. So this is 1999 was the smart board. And this also now is where we, ha we have technology, we have all this information, and this is about the time that the World Wide Web came out, but also there's going to be a model of this interactivity in that the whiteboard, you draw something, it gets erased versus the smart board, you draw something and it gets recorded and it is now accessible to the students or students will be interacting to show things. And so this is actually a really important point in that um, any students who are coming up in this time is this ability to have an interactive uh, relationship with technology. It's not passive anymore. That's what our old didactic lectures were just, I lecture and you listen. Now our new younger learners, they don't, th th that doesn't just work for them to memorize and regurgitate what you tell them. There is an element of interactiveness that is going to be really valuable and standard uh, for different types of teaching um, uh, models. So that's our smart board and now getting into our generation Z. So um, <clears throat> my daughter was born in 2009 and her interactions with technology absolutely have been completely changed <laughs> with the touch screen. So iPhone doesn't even seem that long ago, but again, can we imagine our world without smartphones? And absolutely, the, the iPad became that went into our classrooms. And so it's this ability to, um, it, it, to take the information, have it available, guide with those learning management systems, but then have that interactivity. Um, my child grew up with the ABC mouse um, whenever she was a, a child, and there was just this really, um, the, 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 this model of being able to touch things and to manipulate things and to see the outcome that this was, the, the, these are first touch screens that I just, we, we vision from the Star Trek movies that we, we can see that the students of the future are going to have this ability to interact in uh, different ways. Um, and so this, again, wanted to highlight major technologies to set the stage that our current learners and our future learners, they really do see the world differently. They interact with the world differently. And it is so important for us uh, to, 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 I don't want to say keep up, actually keep ahead of the curve so that we can introduce newer technologies to, um, uh, to, to meet their needs. So this is called the touchscreen generation. And I, um, my, my child, um, uh, we have a VR headset in the, in the household. Um, and th th that, that ability, that interactivity is just become such a commonplace expectation for our younger learners that it's important for us to, um, again, incorporate that. So um, just uh, also looking about our major shifts um, in 2020, um, that's whenever um, at, at least my institution and uh, most uh, higher education, um, my, my child was at home, and that's where we're using the term e-learning. So e-learning is a very broad term uh, that's talking about electronic learning, um, but we really needed to have uh, this quick adaptation to have lessons and to have um, activities for students whenever we were in a different location. Um, even what we're doing right now, we're using this technology called Zoom uh, so that I can uh, you know, tell you about this uh, topic I'm passionate about. Um, so how do we best use that? That's now where the question is. That the world has changed. Um, virtual is a big deal. Uh, E-learning is here and it's very, very valuable. We're not going to go back. But the question now is, is best practices. So so this show you um, in that uh, prior to, um, so this is our uh, 2002, 2001, 2000. So prior to 2000, if I just do a search at e-learning and medical education, um, it, there were some of us who were interested. Actually, I was doing a literature search in 2019 and there was a debate about e-learning. There was a debate about the, the virtual activities. 
versus once whenever we had this tremendous pandemic and it was a shift to all virtual, uh, there was a surge in publications, there was a surge in interest. Um, and so absolutely, um, it, there's a lot of benefits that came out of this traumatic global event. But now we're at this point about what's the best practice. And so that's what I'll be focusing on for my literature search, search today it, it is why, why is this uh, using um, uh, digital visualization why is it that virtual labs uh, have benefits and how it works with our existing structures of um, uh, the different ways to teach students in the classroom. So um, I absolutely, I do want to highlight um, about uh, the processing of information in that regarding, um, this is Generation Z dominates online searches for information post-millennial generation. So this is looking at a relative scale of just searches in that our, our um, you know, our, our, our millennials, our Gen X, like those of us, I still love a textbook. I still love a book. And so I'm not as um, inundated with our, our, our TikTok and our YouTube tubes that, that my kid is. But the problem is, is that our younger learners, they, they have too much information. Um, certainly there's issue with this misinformation. So again, <clears throat> Information's out there, it's accessible, but we as the educators, we need to be guided. So that's what I wanna point out about for um, uh, what is it about the virtual labs that are of benefit. So also of note uh, that wanna bring in Disengagement of current learners uh, potentially leads, indicates that education model for baby boomers and Gen X leads reform. So this is actually from the Chronicle of Higher Education. Um, there is this really, uh, the, the virtual world that was in our pandemic and now they're returning to the classrooms, students are disengaged. Students are disinterested. They almost are uh, inundated with so much entertainment and so much um, sort of uh, that that dopamine uh, sort of a, a, a videos or whatnot. I might know my TikTok. I'm, I date myself whenever I have. I'm like I don't get it, but it's cool. Um, but actually, I'm making a point that whenever we have this generation and reading textbooks and list and didactic PowerPoints and memorizing and regurgitating, it just is not adapting to their perspective of the world. And there is this really dramatic um, uh, phenomenon that's happening in higher education as well K through 12, that the students are coming back and they were so, had so much screen time that there's a disconnect. And so how do we engage learners? That, that, that's a really foundational question, as well as uh, especially students who are, um, non-traditional students who have learning disabilities, um, what do we do to adapt? What do we do to actually uh, inc increase engagement? And that is now um, uh, the, the virtual realities, the augmented realities, they have potential to rope in the engagement of students, but guide them about their learning. So this is now education technology of, I don't want to say now, we're doing it now, which is incredible, which are, um, when I finish talking, um, uh, my colleagues will present about uh, their particular product. I'm actually just showing some uh, anatomy. So I'm a medical school professor and uh, absolutely anatomy has been phenomenal for the ability to not just see, they're not stagnant organs. They actually have shape. And so um, I, a virtual reality headset that my 13 year old child puts on and she can actually zoom in and be in the heart to see the different chambers. And you have an option that you can change it that somebody has coronary disease, or you can see what happens to the structures that is going to be changing that if somebody has a heart attack. And so this is a potential, this really wonderful tool that is going to be just, it's got the ability to be actually accurate science. Um, it is also going to have that ability for students to interact. And I really, I, I again, I, I feel like I'm preaching in the choir. If you're here, you're interested, but this is potential uh, to provide engagement. So um, this is actually looking at some literature about um, uh, use of virtual reality or, or augmented reality. So I just abbreviate this. Um, and so this was uh, uh, looking about a meta-analysis for K through 12. And so one thing that we will observe is that um, 
uh, there's been a surge uh, post, uh, you know, uh, kind of leading up to the pandemic, but it also has to do with technology. And so uh, there, there's Google Glass, but there's, say, for instance, like uh, the Oculus Quest. Um, there's also, uh, you know, there's Google products, there's the uh, Facebook products. And so the technology now has become accessible. And I think it's one of the hot presents for right now is the, the, the Google Quest. So uh, the, the technology has just become more accessible. Therefore, there is more interest in um, research in the efficacy of these technologies in the classroom. So looking at K through 12, um, this is actually a really nice distribution uh, that's looking about, well, who? who are using these new technologies. And what you can observe is that um, the, the use of uh, um, augmented reality and virtual reality spans across all age groups. So this is not just restricted to a certain age. Um, our, our technologies in education are going to be used even at the very young ages. Um, we see the highest uh, publications for studies that were done in elementary school. That being said, no matter what your education level is for your teaching as an educator, if the students are starting to use these in elementary school, continue to middle school, up to high school and absolutely we're using this in medical education it's important for us to keep up with these trends. I also wanna highlight that the sciences. And so I do wanna focus on that for myself. I'm a microbiologist. And so uh, for me, uh, the using virtual reality in the science context is makes, uh, it is so amenable. Um, and we can see that trend in our studies that we see with K through 12. Last thing from this paper that I wanted to highlight is how are these actually being used? We do have direct instruction that you can use um, augmented reality or virtual reality to teach concepts and vocabulary, which is great. That, that is uh, an engaging way for students to learn uh, basic knowledge. But what is also very beneficial is this ability to do experimental learning, trial and error. And that will come up whenever we see a demonstration video for VR labs uh, today um, and inquiry based. Um, and that if you have these labs that are set up in the virtual reality, it has the ability to guide the students through the scientific process. Um, well, unfortunately, uh, most of the time you say, oh, it's science fair time. You got to learn the scientific process. All parents roll their eyes and say, no, we don't want to do it. I don't know if any of you have kids who've ever had that experience. But what we can do is guide the scientific process with interactivity at the different steps. And it allows the students to have engagement, but also to uh, learn about making mistakes. So um, that's what I just wanted to highlight that uh, when we say virtual learning, it's not just about that memorization with your teaching, it is about the process. So also, also this actually was a, um, a pretty thorough a paper, which uh, we'll, we'll be um, uh, publishing or posting um, this uh, uh, this PowerPoint. So you're welcome to read up any of these uh, uh, citations. Um, in that allowing the students in the virtual lab, they can go through the process, but you can guide them through the steps to have that critical thinking aspect. So you can iteratively test and say, all right, here's variable one, what happens? Here's variable two, what happens? Why does that happen? And so this is actually now where I really say that um, this is a quote from this, this paper, the effect of applying virtual labs can be augmented by instructional design that engages students in critiquing experiments prior to their inquiry with the virtual lab. So when I've done labs in undergraduate, I remember I just had a set of steps and I had the reagents and I didn't really understand what was going on because I couldn't manipulate the steps or the stages. It was one, two, three, four. And if you messed up on step two, you were done with the experiment. Where the virtual labs, this has this wonderful ability to, um, to, to really practice and have error and to have that individual steps of like, if a variable one turned out this way, why is that? And those questions can be embedded in the virtual lab. Variable two, this was the different outcome. Why is that? And again, this is a really great opportunity that they can come back to the same setup and they can have different outcomes. 
So this uh, this particular um, uh, paper was actually getting into um, this was a meta uh, analysis, a systemic review, and it was looking at the benefit of this is what we call the head mounted device. So uh, this is like our Oculus Quest, which is I have at home. Um, and so what's the benefit um, in that? it provides spatial content. And so that's what, whenever you have a textbook for an anatomical structure, it doesn't give the dimensionality, nor do you have the ability to peel back layers to really see depth of the actual real body. Um, and absolutely a consistent story um, with uh, different publications about looking about efficacy of um, this uh, augmented reality or virtual reality um, activities, lab activities, especially the anatomy, um, is that it's engaging. And so for this particular publications, majority of the studies were effective for learning outcomes. Absolutely engaging. That's a universal theme that um, I, I find with students of having something that's beyond just a straight textbook that was appropriate with our baby boomers and Gen X, but they really want to have that interactivity um, that they're, they grew up with with the uh, touch screens. So um, additional um, uh, sort of uh, last bit of uh, evidence, this is actually a study that was done on, um, on uh, it was called the tour of the cell. And so that's another uh, a a strategy. It's not just a one uh, biological science, the anatomy, but we also see this in cell biology. And what they uh, asked the questions um, of these students, so these were undergraduate students, and, um, you know, did the virtual reality enhance your learning experience in the cell biology course? I mean, it was just resounding, yes. And if you ask the question of, would you recommend this for other disciplines? So I would recommend the use of innovative learning tools like virtual reality in my other courses. I mean, it was a vast majority of them strongly agree, or uh, agree, <laughs> or we only had neither disagree or disagree, but uh, this is, this is coming from the student's perspective. And so uh, the, there absolutely is evidence that it's engaging, that it is effective, that it's going to have this opportunity for students to, um, uh, to try and to make errors and to uh, make intentional mistakes and learn from it, but they just, they love it. And so I'm a student-centered learner. And if there is a technology, if there is some way that I can teach them better than the way I was teaching them five years ago, I'm going to take the responsibility to learn how to do it because I want the best for my students. So yeah, this is um, the, just uh, uh, student responses. Uh, they were uh, increased interest, better understanding, because especially the depth of our um, biological uh, structures and a new perspective. So finishing up for um, about what I consider of this literature review about the benefits of virtual reality, um, I really want to touch on about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and so when I was growing up, I certainly was there. You had, if you ask a child what a scientist looked like, it was a uh, it was a Caucasian person with gray hair, male glasses, and a lab coat. And that is what a scientist looked like. But things have changed quite dramatically in that we really need to make an intentional effort in the sciences uh, to, to include individuals who are interested in the scientific process and to give them tools so that they are interested and they can make mistakes. When I was an undergraduate, uh, it was absolutely in the sciences you had had to be right. You had to know what the answer was. And that is not true anymore. We really want students to be learned and hands on and to have that freedom. Again, I, I'm making mistakes for that, re, uh, that iterative uh, process of science because that is actually science. So the virtual reality science activities, uh, this is actually going to be fantastic. And this is a paper uh, that looks at um, <clears throat> uh, present in the classroom and absence science, the individual societal impact and an equitable science instruction and challenge to improve science instruction. So this current research allows equity oriented instruction centers around a student to navigate different 
perspectives. And so this is um, uh, just if we have memorized regurgitate, again, if you're here, I, I don't need to convince you that that is an outdated methodology, but we want to have students learn in a classroom. We do want to have them learn with the teacher guidance, but we want to have them ability to practice, to use. And that's another thing about the virtual labs is it actually places them in a laboratory setting. So place-based science learning, and they will get in that mindset where they are in the role of a scientist and they are more engaged and more valuable where their hands are controlling what the hands are doing. And the last thing uh, from this paper is that science is actionable, that it is not passive. Things don't just happen. There actually needs to be that interactivity so that whenever you have set up and you have different um, components going in that you can see what the outcome is. And that's another benefit of the virtual uh, learning activity. So these are just to highlight some of the literature backing about my perspective of the value. Um, but just in general, um, talking about, and I'm, I'll hand over um, uh, to give the demonstration for uh, this amazing product, Virtual Lab Academy, um, is touching on to uh, just some practicalities. And so uh, safety and accessibility. Um, uh, safety, I certainly remember in my undergraduate University of Texas, Austin, once a week there was a fire. <laughs> I mean, I, I can tell you so many lab uh, experiments of uh, that the, somebody's hair getting caught on fire from a Bunsen burner. I'm not going to go too far in lab activities, uh, but these are safe. But it's also accessible in that these platforms are can be used on a PC, on a Mac, in a classroom, um, the virtual reality headsets. Uh, there is a cost limitation, um, but once we have a school have them, they can actually go out and do outreach and say, for instance, you have got a well-funded university uh, in, in the major city. They can go out into the rural areas and really reach to some of our disadvantaged students. Uh, same thing with reduced costs and um, uh, it, it's budget cuts, budget cuts, budget cuts, budget cuts. Uh, that's very unfortunate for the sciences because some labs, absolutely, the reagents are expensive. Um, I even here I am for my research. I'm uh, held up because <laughs> I ordered my reagents about four months ago. Supply chain, where if we have a lesson plan that's dependent on getting this one reagent that are potentially very expensive, this the virtual labs will provide an activity for the students to be able to still doing their lessons um, and, and have some cutting edge uh, tools and some cutting edge uh, equipment that uh, normally an elementary school or a high school could never afford. So also uh, very much, uh, this is fantastic that we have the ability uh, to have individuals being put in the position of a scientist. Um, and it doesn't matter your language. It doesn't matter about your socioeconomic background. Everyone is equal whenever they start doing this virtual reality labs, you know, assuming guidance from the teacher. And so that's some wonderful accessibility that I just, I, I really see uh, these type of technologies uh, spreading globally as a standard practice because uh, we really want to have the ability uh, to provide these opportunities for students regardless of how much money the school district has. And then also I really highlighted it is um, so science, science is messy. Science, you make mistakes. And if you make one mistake, it's beneficial to learn from it, which is a great benefit of these virtual labs. So another thing that's really great um, is that it can be incorporated with actual classroom activities. And so that's actually well finished up with um, is that uh, I'm not advocating everything virtual. I absolutely, I don't, um, being strictly virtual, there was a lot of uh, missing uh, person to person. Um, and so I just wanna highlight that the, the virtual labs are to be with the classroom with the textbook, um, but it is just, it's a different way to approach the, um, you know, and again, I'm focusing on science, but it's applicable to different one, uh, different subjects, um, in that you have this fantastic ability to have 
bookends that you can have assessments uh, done either in the classroom or in the virtual lab. And then you can be uh, uh, seeing where the students have their misconceptions. And then you can also have it so that they can practice. That is something that's never been available for our lab activities before. So there's just incredible benefits. Um, and that's, uh, I have a question. So that's what um, I have for um, my uh, passionate topic. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and just thank you very much. And I actually will be handing over to IPAC for uh, doing a demonstration of the Virtual Lab Academy. So I'll do a stop share and feel free. Uh, we'll um, I'll take your questions and then we'll be uh, answering them after the video demonstration. Hi everyone, thank you Jane for this inspiring presentation. Now I will like to show some examples that's about just what Jane mentioned about the usage of virtual laboratories from our product. I choose two experiments for you today. One of is from biology laboratory and the other is from uh, VR lab chemistry laboratory. Let me share the video. Okay, let's see it in action. Now we are in the virtual laboratory and we have the light soft because we are going to measure the effects of light intensity on rate of photosynthesis. As you can see, the light intensity is decreasing as you change the location of the pop test and it will allow users to use multiple locations. Now let's close the light and take a sample and start the experiment. As you can see, we have um, nearly limitless samples here so that users can uh, try multiple times. And you can see the different uh, location options for students. So this, this really provides a pretty inquiry space for students to conduct their own experiment in, in their own setup. And it will also let them to use multiple variables. So here we were going to uh, also use the wavelength with the color filters. Also, you can uh, just change the temperature or the carbon dioxide concentration for this photosynthesis experiment. And also, you don't have to wait for days or long times for these reactions to occur. As you open the light, you can also see that the timer, yeah, this is the great thing. You can speed up the time and it will take you less time for to conduct the experiment. And now at the end, we have the samples and we are going to use a spectrophotometer to measure the absorbance. So this is not an usual thing for for example, a high school student to use th this kind of uh, equipment since this is quite expensive. But with the virtual lab, uh, lab, as just Jane mentioned, now it is accessible for all from their home, from their PC. They are able to use um, each of those equipments. This was all from the photosynthesis. And this is a chemistry experiment. Maybe you know that titration, like uh, the acid and base reaction. As you can see, this is a quite realistic laboratory and you will uh, have to even measure the drop by drop um, liquid, the titrate, and you have to observe and you have to take your own data from this observation. So as just Jane mentioned, this is how users and students can able to practice the scientific process. They can try and make errors here if they like in the photosynthesis experiment, if they don't like wait for 30 minutes, if they wait for 10 minutes, then all their results will be according to that time, which means that we are using real values, real data and formula based approach that helps students to really progress the scientific methodology. And you just see the change in the uh, yeah, the reaction. And 
we also have the VR lab tablet, which is a must in every laboratory because you have to um, take notes and you have to record your data. So as you can see, there are the three trial options. Students can conduct the experiment and take the average values and then continue with the hypothesis. They can write their hypothesis and when they save data, they will going to reach the answer key, but this is a not a usual answer key actually. Here we have the sample answers, but the answer key is actually personalized and adaptive for students' values, which means that every student in the class will will going to have a personal answer key reflecting their experiment, their setup, and their dependent independent variables, which offer students again a free exploratory environment. So this is what we try to succeed with our product to solve the problems. That was all. Thank you for your interest. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ipek. Um, after the presentation, we wanted to show a little bit of how we address um, this subject at VRLIP Academy. So uh, we hope you have an idea, a bit more clarification now. Um, and I'd like to uh, thank Jane for the presentation. It was very um, valuable to listen um, such an interesting and deep topic with examples and to um, share her personal experiences with us. Um, I'm, I'm sure that as educators, you found something close to you in it. And now I'd like to continue with the questions in Q&A section. So um, please feel free to uh, share your questions. I will just start with the ones that are already asked right now. So let me check um, and okay. Jane, I start with questions, if that's okay for you too. Yep. Okay. Uh, so first question is, even though you didn't mention this solution as a replacement of cl classical approach uh, during your presentation, I wonder what you think of topics that require sensory learning, like smell, detection of texture, et cetera. Ooh. That's a really good question. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, um, yeah, some of the chemistry experiments. Um, I, I, I imagine that the technology will be updated so that there are smells <laughs> aspects of it. Um, but uh, I actually don't, I don't know the answer to that. For, for microbiology, for growing stuff, uh, it's actually the smells are to be avoided. Um, so um, that's actually a good question, but you know, there, yeah. there are some things that we do not have the technology yet to, mm -hmm. uh, to replace. So um, mm -hmm. trying to think of stinky smells. <laughs> I don't and, know, and and that, that's why maybe it, it's, that. that's yeah, a great it's question. Be like a hybrid system for now, at least. And um, as I know that technology is improving and there are now haptic gloves or you know this haptic technology and uh, I think that will be the next step with virtual reality so I just wanted to um, add something more to this question I, I actually I'm I, 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 I that ties into um, I, the word is hybrid uh, of using technologies digital visualization with um, you know, in, in classroom, um, my child won science fair projects for doing an activity on slime. You know, we did slime and we did um, uh, with the uh, corn starch. Um, and so that was very tactile important. But if we had it so that there was a partnership, there was digital and there was the polymerization and there was so much stuff that was happening on a molecular level that mm -hmm. yes, you could have the kinesthetic activity, especially for younger children, that's very valuable. But then you would also have a partnered virtual representation about what is going on at a level that is smaller than the naked eye could see. Mm -hmm. So um, th that, that's what I, I do not I do not advocate for uh, getting rid of our, our, our classic you know, only I, it's really it's evolving so that we incorporate new and different perspectives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's about empowering the part that you already have. And so uh, 
continue with second question. Um, how do you see the place of teachers in the future with the increasing use of VR and technology in general? I think that although this scares educators, the way VR involved will change. And I think it is inevitable, but I wonder what you think. Uh, guidance. I am uh, the learner. The learner-centered paradigm of education is that I am a coach. Um, I am not here to dictate. I am here to help you learn. And so, I do not think that just giving students virtual reality headset and the program without context uh, is valuable. Where the educator sets the student up with the core knowledge, with the core information, vocabulary. And then they do an activity, a virtual laboratory activity, and then there's assessments afterwards. And so the the um, the educators are there to guide. They are there to assess, and then also to uh, interact with students. Get uh, if, if there's something that's lost or disconnected, uh, you you can never take away a coach. If you've got a bunch of, of kids playing a soccer game or football game for a World Cup, you have to have the coach there to have them set up to succeed and then to be there with them uh, to, to, to walk away and say you did a good job. Exactly, I, I, I totally agree this one. Um, and the, the next question would be, how does the visualization offered in virtual labs differ from using images or YouTube videos in lessons? Uh, the acti the um, uh, interactivity, um, I mean, a, a YouTube video is still passive. Um, and, and that a student is, is watching, you can't have embedded assessments and you don't have that interactivity. It's linear story. If you watch a YouTube video, the same thing happens every single time you watch that YouTube video where that's what the, the virtual labs and we very much, I peg thank you so much for your demonstration is it showed that there is that ability uh, to, to, to choose you know, choose your own adventure, but you can choose what is the setup and you can make the mistakes. And so that is completely missing from our TikTok videos. <laughs> you, you don't have, you don't have the actual uh, scientific process that has different outcomes based on the different variables that are put in. Yeah. So you can give a YouTube video or you can give, uh, you know, visualization as a preparation, um, but, but it, it will not substitute the interactivity. Yeah, it's all having a hybrid system, definitely. Um, so next question. Um, for which part of learning module in a medical school would you prefer to support learners with virtual labs? Um, I mean, anatomy, it's, it's almost become standard now. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a microbiologist in infectious disease, and I would love to see more content, hint, hint, m &A, um, about uh, uh, immunology and diagnostics, um, and that the content's not available yet. Um, in medical school, um, we did, uh, there, there is a lot about uh, clinical skills uh, in medicine, um, uh, surgical practices, procedures, uh, th those are being uh, used very routinely yeah. uh, at major uh, medical institutions. Institutions, um, and so uh, there's a lot of practicality um, regarding the microbiology wet labs. I mean, they're pretty much absent now from, um, unfortunately, um, uh, from uh, doing the the microbiology, doing the uh, microscopy, um, and so I, I would love to have that option um, to, to have the students to be able to to see the different microbes. Um, so I, it's. Uh, it's in its infancy for, um, you know, for high air educations about the content that's available, um, but I, I would love to see more for uh, diagnostics uh, regarding it. My, my topics of infectious disease, um, but I, I lecture to students and, and they, it's more, it's still in that memorization aspect where if I could actually show diagnostics and zoom in microscopy, um, mm -hmm. that, that would be very valuable. And that would be quite more accessible, right? Like to to have this solution as a just as your go to solution, um, even for trainings, not just in in, in the learning period maybe, but um, afterwards too, and the expertise also. And so one other question is that um, how do you think the future of that laboratory education for undergraduates will evolve with this solution? 
Um, uh, <clears throat> I, I foresee, I, 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 I keep coming back to the hybrid. I mean, the undergraduate in, institution, the undergraduate is, uh, microbiology is, is my experience, uh, chemistry, um, in that they would have the ability to practice before they do labs. Um, that, that I think that that's, um, they, they come in, they do the labs, and usually what happens is one person really knows what they're doing and they do most of the work. One person does not know what's going on and they sit back and they let the other person yeah. do it. Um, Story of Rupert. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I, would, I would love to see the incorporation of virtual labs to allow students to practice on an individual basis so that they, they, they get the mastery before they set foot into the lab to, to mm -hmm. actually you know, do an experiment so that they, they actually can grasp what the different components are and that, that there will be you know with with the virtual uh, um, labs um, that they would be able to have those explanations set up for them um, and so I, I think that's going to be a better uh, for individual development versus just doing the wet lab that the the one out of four does it perfectly and the other students just watch so again a complimentary yeah yeah and um we have another question. I think this answer was kind of its answer to which was what is the most effective way to engage learners in virtual session? Um, I, I think this was pre pretty much this question's uh, answer to you, but if you have any additions. Uh, I, 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 uh, questions and assessment that, that that's if they, if they go through a whole activity and there's 10 steps to it and they get an outcome um, that that is it's it's a fun for them. It's engaging, but th there needs to be a, conceptual assessments, and questions that are there. Um, because I'm medical, everything's case based, um, and so I I would say here's a patient, and this is we're going to be doing an experiment on their blood chemistry, um, and that we need to we need to be able to take what they're doing in in the virtual or in in wet labs and put it in real world context to make it um, you know. A, much more connected. Uh, so, so that's what um, I think of uh, any of these types of activities. It's so important for the educator to put it in context and then to have assessments throughout mm -hmm. so that the students are having an engagement, having an interactivity. Um, and it's also beneficial because if they have a concept that is a mis misconception or they're off somewhere, we can figure out what the step is. So um, I, I, I was just in that, to answer that question is increased interactivity with very deliberate um, structured content. And being able to track that process actually. Yeah. I, I think this is also linked to um, our yeah, other that uh, question. Uh, yeah, this is actually a really good Q&A session right now that one question's answer is linked to another question. Um, the other one would be, uh, how would you measure, measure a student's performance in virtual labs? Um, and I, I, I think this will be a quite fulfilling answer from you. Um, for this right now, um, I would be, I would not grade my personal because it, it is um, right now with the technology, I would want it to be engaging and not intimidating. Um, and that I would have questions in there that weren't graded, but they would be required to move on to the next level that, that they would have, they would have to answer it. And then see, you know, if they they got it incorrect, then we would say, okay, here's your content to make sure you get on. So that's a, a fantastic way of progress um, uh, of assessing student progression is how their answers are are developing. Um, you could grade, um, and I, and I, I wouldn't want to put a high weight on it, but the lab notebook, like uh, I I pecked at the demonstration where they entered in the values where they would have to do their calculations and that's the you know show your work that i would say you know you get completion points you know points for uh, doing completion but then i could look back and say oh wow you really missed this step in yeah. this calculation and also some requisite ones yeah yeah we can do remediation so <laughs> um because this is a new technology and we do want it to be fun and engaging i would not be giving them a final exam using this uh, but I, I would do absolutely clear strategies so 
so that there is a, um, a dialogue between the student performance and the observations of the professor. This is actually quite inspirational, like for me at least personally, because it's quite different what I hear from most of the educators that I meet. Um, so that just kind of enlightened me. Um, and the um, other question would be, how about VR and AI relationship in the future and what do you think about it? <laughs> uh, uh, infancy. Um, of the year. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know it's infancy. Uh, just as an example, the Dolly, uh, the the AI art drawings. Um, mm. I I I signed up for it, and it was the artificial intelligence AI drawing. And I said, uh, draw a staph bacteria um, on a cardiac valve and endocarditis. Like that. That's. I mean, that that to me is is kind of a straightforward question that I could find that image. Oh my goodness, the AI does not know science. <laughs> so, so I think that oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, in, its, in, in its infancy, it is a role of us as educators uh, to be in feeding the information that is accurate. Um, mm -hmm. I, if, if we have the AI and just looking about an entire encyclopedia of all science terms, you have to have you have to have us, or you know the, the the Gen X millennials. You have to have us giving the vocabulary, giving the context for it. So yeah. um, regarding, I mean, I'm certainly a Star Trek fan. I imagine all this really cool stuff that I'd be sitting in my office. Maybe yeah, it, it's going to happen sometime. I don't know when. I don't know where. Um, but I really just kind of finishing up now. It takes dedicated passionate educators to be actively developing this material um and then so Kiri is fantastic part of your team who who is a you know a very very talented educator and was there part of this process to make um these labs mm -hmm. um and so so that that's that's just sort of a call to arms for everyone who's attending now um participate you know, go to webinars, go to conferences, be a part of this conversation. And we, the scientists, the educators who learn from the textbooks, um, you know, learn from the libraries, it is our job to educate this, this uh, AI and, and to, to develop this virtual reality uh, so that it, it, it's best for the future. Yeah, yeah. And, and then at the end, it will, again, serve us. So, um. I think this is the last question uh, I have. Uh, one last question is that, how can we be ensured about accessibility for someone um, who's are disabled? This is also a very um, trending topic right now. So I, I, I actually, um, uh, there, there's, uh, it, 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 the physical disabilities are a, a little bit easier to be adaptable um, mm -hmm. because as, if a student has uh, access to a computer um, and they have the tools for what, whatever um, whatever way that they interact, um, that, that that is adaptable. Um, learning styles. Uh, so students who have got uh, dyslexia, who've got uh, ADHD and autism. Um, there's a uh, uh, landmark college. Uh, they're doing some really groundbreaking work uh, for using virtual reality uh, for um, uh, adapting to different um, uh, uh, neurodiverse perspectives. Uh, the one that I do not have the solution for, and it is very much a interest is uh, in people who have visual impairments. Um, and so uh, absolutely, there is a lot of work that's being done globally uh, to meet the needs of different students and different perspectives and different um, uh, uh, really uh, challenges. Um, but the, the one I don't know the answer to yet is, is visually disabled. So that yeah. I, I came up with, with, I had an exam question and it was uh, completely dependent on a color interpretation. And I had a colorblind student and it, 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 it caught me. I was like, mm, I got to adapt. I got to adapt. Yeah, so yeah. It, it, that's a wonderful challenge. But the fact that we're asking that question is, is just a great representation of, mm -hmm. of, of better trends of inclusive instruction. Yeah. Yeah. I hope there will be more research um, while we have the inclusivity is, um, is actually a topic that is being um, talked about right now. 
in, in, in this um, century, let's say. Um, so I think this was all the questions. Let me check for one last time. Um, yeah, yeah, it is. So um, okay. I think we will uh, finish our webinar and our webinar here. Uh, and again, I'd like to thank all of our participants for uh, joining us today and i would also like to thank jane uh once again in peck for taking the time and uh sharing her um expectations for the future and uh we can say now and experiences and such an exciting topic uh our webinar series will continue in the coming months with curriculum specific presentations so feel free to spread the word and you can follow us on our social media accounts to stay informed and um we're just for our free webinars. We will be very happy if you answer the survey uh, that will appear when the webinar is over. Your feedback is quite important to us. And I wish everyone have a wonderful holiday season and a great year ahead. And we hope to see you in the next webinar. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye.